so Lorraine, you you were one of the first in March to come down with COVID, or you believe it was COVID. Can you tell me about that? Well, it, it was COVID based on the symptoms, based on my diagnosis from my physician and at the emergency ward I went to. Um, I'm not one of the first, and that's one of the reasons I did get sick, is someone in our household caught it from one of their chums a week before and was told it can't be COVID. There's no community acquired here at the end of February. We caught it at the beginning of March from them, four to six days later, which is just, it went through our household. We were being so careful, but we didn't know we had to be careful of the person who had the supposed flu or bronchial infection. So it's been around a lot longer than we think. Um, I wasn't tested. There was very little testing going on at that time. And one of the big problems with the test for the virus is 20 to 30% of them say they're negative when really the person has had COVID because the virus only hangs around for the first seven to 14 days after you're infected. After that, it's your immune system turning on a flamethrower to try to get rid of things that are um, infecting you and the immune system's great. It gets it out of there in the first week or two, but it doesn't know how to turn off the flamethrower and it um, turns your lungs. Instead of being full of air, they feel like they're full of egg white and you hurt. And I lost my sense of smell and my sense of taste. I was in pain. I didn't have much fever ever, and um, but my blood oxygenation was very poor. My lungs weren't working. And luckily, I'm a pack rat. And we had my late father-in-law's um, oxygen concentrator and oxygen fingertip meter. And when my oxygen levels fell below 90% of what they should be, we turned, got some new tubing turned on the oxygen and it helped. It didn't get me up to where I should be. We combined it with a CPAP, which is kind of like a BiPAP, only it breathes for you. Right. And that kept me going, and I chose to stay out of hospital. And how are you now? So this is March, April, May, June, July, five months later. Exhausted. It's that feeling when you wake up in the morning and you really need your coffee. And it, it's, it's not dependent on my coffee. I'm just so tired. I'm short of breath. I, um, things are, good things are happening. The lump in my throat is it's gone. Now that there was never one to see, but it blocked my breathing. Um, I have pains where I've been hurt before and gotten all better. And it's bad enough, it wakes me at night and no painkiller seems to help for it. And then one day to the next, after a month of pain, it just goes away or moves somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I have heartburn that I haven't had since I was pregnant 25 years ago. I, um, I have a very muddled brain. I, um, it's like after you've had a baby or you've had surgery or you've been very ill where you just kind of live as a spectator to the world. And to remember things is hard. To remember a second point is hard. To remember what happened yesterday or that friend in grade one or Finding words is hard, and um, I even had trouble for a while putting words in the right order. So I'm not used to that. I'm used to being very articulate. I'm used to being sharp, and I'm used to being able to trust what I say. And I told my husband the other day to go pick up that green thing over there, and I knew it was brown, mm -hmm. and I didn't even realize I'd used the wrong word. What I find so fascinating in a horrible way is, is you were never hospitalized, you were never put on a ventilator, so you wouldn't be considered like a critical case. And yet five months later, you're describing symptoms that are life altering. Yes, and I'm not alone. A lot of people are living with what I'm living. They've not had a positive test. And particularly the women tend to be told by their doctors their anxiety is the cause of all their problems. Whereas when you're not getting enough oxygen, you become anxious. Um, right. We see that in extreme cases where people have someone down on the ground and they're block, block, blocking their breathing, mm -hmm. they fight it off. And that's not resisting arrest, that's trying to survive. 
And when your oxygen concentration is lower, you naturally feel very anxious. And people who've been calm and gliding through life forever are now so tense and so worried. And it makes your heart rate go up as your blood isn't getting enough oxygen. Your heart will go up to try and circulate it faster to get more oxygen out. So there's these cascade of events that are all quirky things. But if you look at things like Survivor Corps or the Canadian group, you start seeing repeated patterns in there. The loss of taste, which is quite unusual for an infection. The loss of energy, the brain muddledness, and then the lump in the throat, old injuries coming back to haunt you, even though they've been healed for a long time. And doctors saying to the women in particular, this is all in your head. I'll give, give you a, an appointment with a psychiatrist or I'll give you a med to calm you down and that should take care of it all. But really? It and women in particular are being told this after yes. COVID? Really? And the men, men are hearing, I'm sorry, we don't know quite what's going on and we don't know what to do. So Lorraine, would you take a deep breath for me? Sure. And now I hear, I hear it here when you do that. And sometimes when you speak, is, is, is that new? Is that a result of COVID? Absolutely. I could ride my bike. I could play soccer. I could run up and down the stairs. We live in a big old house that we moved on our lot. It's got tons of stairs. And I could live vigorously. And I did live vigorously. And I can't now. And when I've been on a second phone call in the daytime, I have to stop and take a breath after every sentence. It's not voluntary. My body just does it naturally to compensate. But it's not the way I lived. But I'm much better than I was before. And do you still see yourself getting better? Or have you stalled in your recovery? It's both. Um, it's actually not a plateau and it's not a gradual increase. It's a zigzag. Okay. By April 10th, I'd been recovering for a month and I was doing more and more each day. I could walk around Gary Point Park out here in Richmond, which is a kilometer. I could go for a 45 minute walk with my husband. I could do housework. I could be up and doing things for three hours. The next day, I'd seen some breathing exercises from a respiratory specialist online. My mistake. I tried them the deep breath for four in, the deep breath for four out, and then cough on the third or fourth one. I did that and my lungs shut down. It felt like someone had taken a, a, an old helium balloon and pricked it and it just crumpled in. I couldn't breathe and we were off to emerge. And the doc there said, yep, this happens. And I was back to bed for days and then I could get up and be, lie on the couch. And then I got better and then I crashed again. And it's this pattern we're seeing, this relapsing, remitting, which other immune disorders cause. Multiple sclerosis has this. This is not MS. But the immune system is playing havoc. And sometimes it's caused each time by an immune reaction. And sometimes it seems to be caused by damage done by the immune system. And we don't know what sets it off. It's like a toddler who's been in a rage and they're on the floor and they finally start calming down and something sets them off again and away they go. That's what our bodies are doing. Are you worried you're never going to get back to pre-COVID health? Oh, yes. Very much so. Yes, it's, it's a huge worry because no one can tell us what's going to happen because we're the first batch of acknowledged people who've had it and who are looking to recover. There are no set forms of exercises for breathing or for physical rehab or the people that have trouble with their liver, their lungs, their kidneys, their bladder, their their circulatory system, their brains. There is no roadmap yet, but thankfully there's some good research starting that will help others. My, my hope is, now that we know the first 10 days are when you have to go after the virus, but after that you have to go after the immune response, mm -hmm. is by using some of the old um, immune 
drugs that calm it down and some of the new ones that are very targeted to different interferons, we may be able to calm down this damaging reaction before it does so much damage. Right. So it won't help me, but it would help others. So uh, I have two more questions for you. And, and by the way, I'm, I'm, you're, you're just phenomenal to speak to. So thank you very much for this. Okay. You really are amazing. You kind. <laughs> no, I'm being honest. Um, can we talk about the COVID long haulers Facebook post that you're part of? I mean, this COVID long haulers like on Facebook is appearing around the world. What, what does that mean and what does that do for you? Is this it, like a support group for COVID survivors? It is. It's very much a support group. They need to get more people with a, 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 a pharmacist, um, a medical researcher, a physiologist involved so that they keep them on track. Because once in a while they get a little off track with their scientific interpretations. But for the most part, it's other people like me. And I can see that I'm not alone. And I can also say to other people, okay, this is happening, but there will be better days. I don't say those better days may not last, but there are better days. And um, it is a real help to know that there are more out there. And it, it seems like the closing scene of Les Miserables where everybody's marching and can you hear the people sing? I think through this grassroots movement, the researchers and rehab physicians have to hear the people sing, or at least try to sing. So, so this is, you're describing this as a grassroots roots movement. What, what are you hoping to accomplish with this Facebook group? I didn't start either of them, we just participate. But what we're hoping is governments will listen, researchers will listen, doctors will listen, and GPs, those doctors will listen and realize they shouldn't be dismissing patients. At best, you can tell us, I'm sorry, I don't know. But you can go and read and you can find out to whom you should refer people. Um, one of the things we need so badly is respiratory therapists. Because as I learned bitterly, you need someone that just works with you and not someone who posts something online. Because every person is so different. And this is the first thing I have ever had where doing a bit more doesn't strengthen you, it weakens you. We need help from doctors, we need to be believed, and we need government putting as much money into this recovery as they have into the treatment. Otherwise, they're going to have a bunch of very sick people for the rest of their lives, and some of us are 25. They've got long lives ahead of them, and we will be at least a financial drain on the system if not an emotional drain on our lives and our families. So this Facebook site isn't just an emotional um, boost or, or emotional therapy. This is, you're, you're starting a movement to make demands and to raise awareness as well. Well, I didn't start the movement, I participate in it. You're part but of it. very much so, it's to, it's, it's to support each other. But when you have 70,000 people saying, we're seeing pretty much the same things, You've got to listen. Um, a study that was published in The Guardian in England, 156 doctors, vibrant people, got sick with COVID-19. A couple of months later, only half were well enough to return to work at all. Yeah. So how many people are on this Facebook group that you're in? I'm in a couple. The Canadian one, it's thousands. In the US-based one, it's over 70,000. And what's the US-based one? It's called Survivor Core, C-O-R-P-S. Thank you. I'm just writing that down. And, no problem. And uh, COVID long haulers is several thousand? It is. It'll say as soon as you sign on. It changes by the day. It. And it's not been going as long as the American one. Um, the woman who moderates it is utterly amazing. And um, I'm just so grateful to her for starting it. It has made such a difference in so many lives. And I'm also grateful to you and the media for going, oh, there's a problem. Let's let people know they're not alone and that we need to do something. So thank you. It's my pleasure. So Lorraine, you're, you're in Richmond, BC. 
I am. Here in Ontario, uh, we get the daily stats of how many people are considered recovered, and we're somewhere around 89% recovery rate in Ontario right now. But recovered implies that you're all better, and, <laughs> and, and you've moved forward, and you're not sick <coughs> No, that's, that's not true. Um, in our household, one person had a very mild case and did get completely better. But the other two, besides myself, have had lingering effects. And my husband in particular has far more fatigue than he would normally. He's a soccer player. Mm -hmm. um, he runs, he jogs, and he's not able to do that. He has muscles mainly where they actually just join on to a bone, hurt so badly, and then suddenly go away after a month. So he's not fully recovered. And the thing is, we didn't appear on any of the counts, any of the records. The person who brought it into our house, the four of us, and the six who accidentally got it from us. None of us appear in the records. Because that was the early days when everybody wasn't being tested so readily. Right. So do you think that, we're, that people are being deceived when they see a recovery rate, like a government stat saying recovery rate, 89%? Are, are, are we getting false, false hope or false, uh, a false impression that- I wouldn't say deceived. deceived. I, would, I would, wouldn't say deceived. I would say it's a false impression. The public health people have to work with confirmed data. And the data is so powerful in a situation like this. We've seen that. Mm -hmm. Without accurate information, you're hooped. So they had to be sure it was COVID-19, not influenza, not a mild cold. And the only tool they had was the virus test, the PCR. Yeah. So I don't think we've been fooled, but I think we may be surprised if we can ever get an accurate antibody test to see what proportion of the population has had it. And from, of the, from some of the scientists I've heard are estimating it's about 10 times the confirmed cases. But when I'm, I'm, and I used the wrong choice of words when I said deceived, I didn't quite mean it that way. Um, that wasn't my intent, but it's more, are we getting the false impression that when people are considered recovered, that they're fine. And, and we're not realizing how catastrophic and lingering this is. Exactly. It's not binary, you live or you die. It's you die or you live, or you live with long-term debilitating problems that we don't know what to do about and we don't know if they're temporary we don't know if there's something we can do to heal better all we knew know is we can't participate in the lives we had at all yeah thank you so very much you're welcome I really appreciate it i really appreciate your time you're welcome